San Diego. He is also the director of San Diego Division of the California Institute, Institute of Telecommunications and Information Technology, so-called Cal IT Square. He leads several interdisciplinary and collaborative projects and has a deep innate interest in neuroscience. So please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Ra. So it's a pleasure for me to be here, to be able to sit in the audience and uh, listen to the experts. Uh, uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Robert Heck Nielsen. Uh, Bob probably needs no introduction uh, to uh, most of us here today. Uh, I'm no expert in neurosciences. I'm a hobbyist uh, at best. Uh, so I thought I would share with you uh, how Bob sort of entered uh, my personal consciousness. Uh, when I arrived at UC San Diego uh, in the 80s, uh, there were these hugely successful neural networks conferences uh, that used to be organized in San Diego, and Bob was very much a part of that. I remember hearing echoes of it not only on campus, uh, but at the IEEE, uh, as well as the Information Theory Society that I was uh, uh, starting to get involved with. Uh, Bob has gone on uh, to become a fellow of, of the IEEE, uh, and much more. Uh, Bob next surfaced... Uh, into our collective consciousness at the University of California, San Diego, when he started to teach this course, uh, it's ECE 270. Uh, graduate courses back then used to typically attract half a dozen to a dozen students, but Bob used to have overflow audiences and I think continues to do so. A hugely popular course, and it drew students in not only from engineering but across campus, uh, and to this day it rem uh, remains one of our most popular courses. Uh, Bob has been recognized for this. Uh, he's won awards uh, uh, from, from the students who have taken the courses uh, and, and so on at the UCSD campus, and he's an adjunct professor at UCSD. Very proud of that. And most recently, when uh, uh, through uh, sort of a combination of circumstances, we were able to establish the California Institute of Telecommunications and Information Technology, uh, so we made it our business to re reach out and assemble a fairly diverse group of people with an activist agenda of trying to get these different domains working together, thinking together, and discovering uh, each other's tools. And I was personally delighted uh, that we were able to have uh, Bob uh, be a part of Cal IT2. We, in fact, house uh, the uh, Confabulation Neurosciences Lab that uh, Bob leads in Cal IT2. And I'm delighted that uh, we have him here with us uh, today for, for the next hour or so. Bob? Ramesh, thank you. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, the cat movie, the kitty movie, as I call it, is here because that without this uh, cat, uh, the discoveries that I'm going to relate to you now uh, would not have been made. And so he played an essential role. It's a very unusual thing for the past. He's 16 years old this month. And for the past 16 years, we've had uh, breakfast most mornings and spent time out uh, going around the family compound together. And during these thousands and thousands of hours, I've had the opportunity to observe him and to stimulate questions and, and eventually answer those questions. There's a lot to cover. Today we're going to start by looking at uh, an overview of this, of this new theory, which is being introduced now. Um, and this theory is uh, at a higher level than our last speaker's uh, talk. Uh, just as a muscle is composed of many, many, many individual fibers, uh, so a, cor a thalamocortical module is composed of many, many, many columns, which was the subject of, of, of Professor Henry Markham's talk. Um, so, so this is at a higher level. And just like a muscle's function is uh, 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 a unification of the function of the smaller pieces, the same thing holds true in cognition. Uh, I believe. We're going to talk a little bit about the work going on in my lab at UCSD, but then most importantly, I'd like to share with you the consequences. So it divides up into two parts, the brain and the mind. Now, it's just past lunch. Um, the tendency is for all of us after eating to uh, begin to go to sleep. So I'm going to give you, hopefully, a motivation to stay awake. This box, which I'll tell you more about and you'll understand much more about later, uh, is essentially filled with little simulations of brain tissue. That's all it is. Um, 
this box also has within it a, a, a capability of carrying out a very, very simplified thought process. And I, when I say thought process, yes, I'm speaking of the real deal. However, this has no algorithms. There's no software other than the simulations. There's no Bayesian networks. There's no priors. There's nothing except this box. This box is exposed to a huge amount of, uh, of uh, text, in particular, things like news stories and so forth, millions and millions of them. And it looks at three sentences in a row drawn from the same paragraph. Now, once you have conditioned it by exposing it to all of this stuff, and you're saying, what does it do? Does it memorize it? No, it's just exactly like in a brain. It, it learns co-occurrences. It says, oh, here's a word, and here's a word five words later. Oh, those appear over and over again, so I'm going to form what's called a knowledge link, which I'll explain in a minute. Now, look what happens here. Once this process has ended, you can put in two successive sentences from the same news story, from the same paragraph of the news story, and then it produces a third sentence, which is a plausible next sentence. Okay? Now, um, re I would just invite you to read this one example. Read this sentence, read this one, and then read its output. Now, are you motivated? Here's some more examples. The first two are the inputs. The sentence in green is the output. So ask yourself two questions. One, what must this know about the composition of valid English sentences? And two, must, what must it know about the world? Okay. And again, this thing has nothing in it. There's no software. There's no algorithms. Uh, both the speakers this morning, Professor Edelman, and Professor Markram emphasized the critically different nature of brain computation. And this, this further exemplifies that point. Now, for, for decades, there have been many, many neuroscientists who have walked around with what you might call a vague working idea about how the brain might function, how it might process information. And here are some of the components of many, many people's idea of that vague sort. One is that if you look in some part of the cerebral cortex, which is this portion encompassed by the green dashed line, then at, at, and if you look at some moment, you'll find that certain neurons are receiving a lot more incoming input from axons uh, to their dendrites and soma than others. And, and so the feeling was that those must, in some sense, represent the answer to a question. Of course, th that everything was vague about it. But basically, the message I'm here to deliver is that, that vague but, but, but basically uh, focused idea was correct. At least, I believe it is. So that's what this theory is all about, is making this not vague, making it very concrete, making it falsifiable, which means it's a theory. So this theory could be wrong, and it's testable. You can decide someday whether or not it is wrong. First of all, we look here at a thing I call a thalamocortical module. Now, the first question you're going to ask, since we just finished Professor Markram's talk, is how does this relate to columns? It basically is made up of hundreds of columns. So what we're going to be discussing here is the next thing up in scale from a column. Another thing is that this thalamocortical module has certain functional properties, one of which is that it has a huge number of groups of neurons. Now you might say, well, are these the reentrant groups that Professor Edelman discussed? Of course they are. But there are huge numbers of them within a fairly delimited area of cortex. Now, how large is this area? Let's just say roughly 45 square millimeters, much larger than a column, hundreds and hundreds of columns. But still, thousands of these make up the cerebral cortex. So it's very much like a muscle, right? Muscles are made up of individual fibers. And then there are hundreds of muscles, so it's a vague analogy which will actually become more uh, specific as we go on. 
Another question is, what is knowledge? This theory specifies precisely what knowledge is. There's only one kind relevant to cognition. There are other kinds, and there are even other kinds in the cerebral cortex. But when it comes to cognition, there's one and only one kind. They're called knowledge links, and we'll talk about that. These individual symbols, as I call them, or we might call them uh, reentrant neuron populations or groups, um, these are formed by exposure to the world, and they are, they are stabilized early in your life. One of these, for example, if this, if this module is responsible for uh, representing the names of objects, uh, maybe number one up here is mother. Number two is something else. And, of course, it does take uh, hundreds of thousands of these. Um, the complexity of neural tissue that we saw in the last talk has got to be there for a reason. If you could do it with smaller numbers of things, you would. But you can't. You have to have that complexity. It's an intrinsic requirement. And this theory absolutely uses that available complexity. The third thing is, what is information processing in cognition? There's only one kind. It's called confabulation. And it's an amazingly simple winner-take-all. Remember I said, whichever group of neurons is getting that maximum excitation is the answer? That's exactly it. The problem is that you have to stop all the other ones from talking briefly. That's a competition. And that's what these modules do as their information processing operation. And finally, where in the heck does behavior come from? Here I am. I'm spinning now. I'm spinning. What caused that? Why did that stop and, or start, and why did it stop? There has to be a unified explanation for behavior, all kinds of behavior, except, of course, reflexive behavior or autonomic behavior. Unfortunately, I don't have to manage the digestion of lunch, which was great, by the way. Thank you, Dharmendra. <laughs> Let's go through these quickly. Again, this is just a sketch. Don't feel uh, telling you everything. Here's a thalamocortical module, a little patch of thalamus, a little zone of, of uh, sorry, a little zone of thalamus, a, a little patch of, of cortex uh, through full depth, about 45 square millimeters, very, very roughly. There's about 4,000 of these covering all of cortex. This is all there is for the cognitive machinery of, of the mind. This is the brain part of the story. What do they really look like? Do they look like these nice little rounded? No, they're messy. Because they're made up of these little columns, and they're probably assembled according to responses that occur early in life to external stimuli and internal drive and goal states. This is looking at layer 2, 3, potentially, in the theory anyway. And here you have the neurons that make up these symbols, symbol groups. These, these reentrant uh, neuron populations are not disjoint. They overlap. Each neuron that functions as part of this representational apparatus belongs to many symbols. It turns out that doesn't cause any problems. Now, I mentioned that there are four elements to the theory. Here, what you see is that about 60 neurons represent this first symbol. 60 neurons represent the second symbol. There's a very strong argument for these being formed in childhood and never varying. Why? It's because these are the representational uh, substrate for our description of, of the mental universe. I'm going to use these notations also as opposed to this when I'm trying to emphasize function as opposed to physiology. Now, what's, we're done with number one. Number two, there's only four. Number two is knowledge links. This is, this is virtually identical to what Heb said in the grossest sense, and that is that if I'm looking at a red apple and this symbol, which represents the name of that thing, namely the word apple, and this symbol over here representing the color of that thing, namely red, happen to be co-occurring, then I'm going to form these knowledge links. Now, one of the mysteries is how can you form knowledge links, say, in your brain, because your brain is sort of pre-wired. You cannot go and make the necessary accidental connections 
in the few instants you have to learn these links. For example, if I told you that the flag of Panama is purple, it isn't, uh, you could learn that right now. The axons do not have to grow to form that knowledge. What is an object in the mental world? It's nothing but a collection of descriptors. Each of these thalamocortical modules is responsible for representing one attribute that an object may have. Here, for example, it represents the motor behavior that might, might apply to eating an apple. Here, it's the somatosensory texture of the apple. Here, it's the color of the apple. Here, it's the odor and taste of the apple. Here, it's the name of the apple. And the knowledge links that form between these symbols because of their co-occurrence, that's the only reason knowledge forms, meaningful co-occurrence, those tie this together, and this is apple. Now, as I mentioned, these links cannot occur directly. This is, of course, the Abilene Sinfire chain idea. And, and it turns out, if you build models of this, this looks very plausible. Obviously, the neuroscience in this area has huge, huge ways to go. But uh, that, that looks like a reasonable thing. Now we're on to number three. What is the information processing of cognition? It's, sim it's simply a winner-take-all. Here's the idea. Let's say that these four uh, thalamocortical modules have already completed uh, their competitions, and they have certain symbols being expressed momentarily. Well, all of the knowledge links from these symbols that go over here to symbols of this fifth module are now sending input to these uh, neuron collections here. And so some of these collections are getting inputs from two of these uh, neuron collections. Some are getting inputs from four. And some are getting the maximum strength of input. By the way, these are just added together. I'll show you later. The value of an additive knowledge combination law is without, un it's, it has unbelievable value because it allows you a flexibility of processing that, that, is, uh, uh, that makes, makes uh, animal life possible, or at least uh, animals above a certain level. Again, I can't go into details. This process of choosing a winner, once those inputs have come in, now you want to do the winner take all and, and have the most excited symbol win. This is a deliberately controlled process. Now, this is one of the most difficult things to imagine. Thinking is as deliberate and as perfectly timed as movement. In fact, I contend that thinking is a phylogenetic outgrowth of movement. So every time that the moment comes when all of the necessary input has arrived, it's now time to have the competition. And an, an actual overt signal comes in to cause that to happen in a tiny amount of time. What happens is here you have about 400,000 neurons that are participating in symbol representations, some of them more active than others. And in 80 milliseconds, all of them are shut off except for one. As this hypothesis becomes more and more accepted, this is going to be providing many, many different groups in neuroscience with a top-down picture of what they need to explain. Now, of course, acceptance of scientific hypotheses does not happen overnight. It happens on the basis of many, many different lines of evidence starting to add up. This will take a long time. You've never seen this before. You're going to see it again. Here's the final part. Where does behavior come from? The hypothesis of the theory, and this is the last piece of the theory, is that every time a conclusion is reached by means of having one of these confabulation competitions, a set of action commands which lead to behavior are immediately launched. The linkage from this winning symbol or, or uh, reentrant uh, neuron population to this particular set of action commands is called skill knowledge. And this is where the basal ganglia come in. This knowledge exists within the cerebral cortex, but it is, it is actually built and controlled by the basal ganglia. It's a very interesting, uh, strange story. Finally, let's go into the mathematics, because you're wondering, well, it sounds really vague. 
It's not. It's completely rigorous. The bottom line is, why is it that picking the most exciting, excited symbol would be worth anything? It's not obvious that it would. In fact, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing that it would. Well, here's the bottom line. What if, you, what if you did this? Well, it turns out the net effect of doing this is to maximize a mathematical quantity called cogency. Okay, some of you know this as likelihood. And the bottom line is that if you maximize this cogency, in other words, if you pick this, this particular symbol that maximizes this probability, in other words, the probability uh, of, of the assumed facts, these things that you're using as inputs being true, given this uh, uh, conclusion, if that's maximized, uh, then that will turn out to be the most excited symbol. <clears throat> Well, the first question is, what would happen if you put a system like this in a logical environment, like playing chess or doing mathematics or physics? Oh, the answer is, it, it gives you the same answers as Aristotelian logic. That's good. Another thing is, how can we show mathematically that this makes sense? Well, it turns out this is a new identity that, uh, uh, that establishes the relationship between this quantity, which is cogency to the fourth power, which is, a, of course, a monotonically increasing function, and this product called the confabulation product. And one of the hypotheses of the theory is that evolution found a way hundreds of millions of years ago of making this set of terms here, the product of these, approximately constant for any viable conclusion epsilon. So in that sense, this thing, by, by maximizing this product, you're maximizing cogency. Well, you can rewrite that product using logarithms like this, and then all of a sudden you see that these can be implemented with real-life biological synapses. They have limited dynamic range. One of the, one of the proposals of the theory is that, this, uh, that most synapses that exist that are, that are used or are potentially available for storing knowledge, and of course not all of them are, only a subset, that 99% that of them are never used. Why? It's because if I'm going to learn that the Panamanian flag is purple, I have to have a much larger amount of wiring so that I can learn that immediately. And the survival value of that immediate learning is so great that, of course, then these, this synapse, the one that you need, is strengthened and, of course, over the next few nights of sleep is made into a permanent, assuming you continue to like that piece of knowledge is made into a permanent uh, piece of knowledge. Very few of these synapses are actually strengthened. OK, so these are the characteristics. Now, how does this make thinking? How can the world, in some sense, we're sort of done with the story of what the brain does? Again, it's a hypothesis, not a proven thing. Of course, it can't be. It's a scientific theory. But it is falsifiable. And as you'll see, it leads to some amazing consequences. The reality is that having one of these little competitions going on at a time is interesting, but having multiple competitions going on is simply amazing. And that's what we're going to look at now. I would love to spend more time talking about the neuroscience and the interface between these ideas and the neuroscience community in general is the purpose of my new laboratory. I want to particularly uh, thank uh, Dr. Thomas McKenna, who is here from ONR, uh, for his uh, staunch support of this new enterprise, and my graduate students uh, who, who are working there. Let's go ahead and actually do confabulation. It's easy to simulate on a computer, win or take all. That's just a sort operation. You take the top of the list. And in fact, the other parts, the learning of, of these co-occurrence links and so forth, simple. So let's go ahead and do this one, where the four, uh, the four modules here that we're simulating are used for holding words in a sequence of words. So this is the word for, lack, of, a. And now we have a fifth module where we're going to do confabulation. Now, where do these knowledge links come from? These are the knowledge bases, the set of all knowledge links going from these over to the fifth one. 
The answer is that we just put in uh, many, many thousands of newspaper articles and encyclopedia articles and novels and so forth. We put in sequences of words from those. And basically, if it saw two words that were appearing together uh, repeatedly, it built a link. There's a total of 5,251, 335 links, knowledge links here. Well, by the way, in this case, what do you get? What is the symbol that has the highest input excitation? It's the symbol for the word unified, for lack of a unified. Hmm, interesting. Then the second most activated symbol is blockbuster. The third is comprehensive. You get the idea. These are a bunch of examples which we're not going to dwell on. <clears throat> the important thing to note here is that this has another very, very useful property. And that is if you put in a nonsense phrase, tune car fly bold, it says, I don't know. Isn't it nice to have an information processing operation that can say, I don't know? There are no symbols that are receiving any reasonable amount of activation at all. Let's now do a more elaborate experiment. Instead of adding just one word to a sequence of words, let's add four words. Now here's the idea. There's two cases. One case is where we have um, a, a uh, set of words called a starter, three words, and we're just going to add four more words on. Another case is where we're given a previous sentence, and then we are given the first three words of the next sentence, and then we're going to add four more words on. These are called sentence continuations. Okay? Let's actually look at the architecture. Now, this has 82 of these thalamocortical modules simulated in it. It has 1,071 knowledge bases, which means groups of knowledge links that go from one module to another. And it has a total of 2 billion knowledge links. Again, where did these come from? It just came from putting in pairs of sentences from English text. Let's actually look at how the thought process that generates the outputs work. During training, we just use this to put in one sentence to represent one sentence, and this one to represent the next sentence. <clears throat> now we put in one sentence here, put in the first three words over here, and then we use this to generate the, f the continuation. Here's an example, a concrete example. There is the context sentence. Here's the starter. We're going to put in four more words. So we put the context sentence in here. It goes up here, goes up through these knowledge links, goes over to here, and gets represented over here. Then we go ahead and put the starter in shortly thereafter, he. <clears throat> these are symbols in here representing those words. We bring in this information. The, again, it's just a knowledge link set that come in here and begin acting on these. Now, I, I won't go through the details, but I'll just show you a couple of things. What we do to start with is we pick a thousand symbols here, which are the most excited, and then we're going to start contracting this list. In the brain, this is sort of like the, the problem of tensioning a muscle. This control signal that, that controls the competition within one thalamocortical module is an analog signal. And so as you pull harder, the list gets shorter. The, the competition heats up. We start with 1,000. Then we do what's called swirling. We just simply use the knowledge links here. Here we're using 1,000 knowledge items. Here we're using 150,000. Here we're using 600,000. Oh, whoa, what's going on here? And look, the number of viable symbols quickly drops. The reason thinking is so powerful is that it applies massively parallel amounts of relevant knowledge. What do I mean by relevant? I mean that the knowledge that's being applied is coming from viable symbols. And this happens very quickly, and it can happen very quickly in a brain. So we made two swirls here. If we do this six times, here's what we get as the next two items. The next word is fumbled. 
And then the next four words are in the end zone. This is called a phrase that the system finds all by itself in the earlier stages of learning. So this, these are the four words fumbled in the end zone. Now let's do one more experiment. Here we have a starter, the New York, no contact sentence. We do the same thing, except notice here, there's no input coming from here, from a previous sentence, because there is no previous sentence. So we go ahead and do the swirling and look what we get for the next four words. Did you notice yet that it's kind of grammatical and that it makes sense? Now let's put in a context sentence with the same starter. Now look what's happening here. This is one of the most crucial parts of the whole talk. The only difference between that last case and this case is that we're just throwing in, we're just throwing in more knowledge links. It's an additive knowledge combination law. And what happens? You go ahead and you basically have all of these competitions converging together, comparing notes. That's what multi-confabulation is. And look what happens. It changes. It changes its answer. It's not talking about the computer model anymore. Now it's talking about something that still makes grammatical sense in terms of the starter, but now it's been influenced by the previous sentence. So you're saying, well, that's kind of interesting. Well, here's some more. And again, this will all be posted, so we're not going to bother to read all this stuff right now because our time is short. Notice it doesn't really make errors of, gra of grammar or syntax. It makes sense. Think again. What does this thing have to know about the world? Okay. So the bottom line is that multi-confabulation allows vast amounts of knowledge to be applied very, very quickly. These architectures have none of the usual ingredients. These are the essence characteristics of confabulation. This tells us that this is a very viable theory of how cognition works. So look, we've gone through two things. We've looked at the, the underlying brain tissue functions and come up with a set of basic functions that underlie cognition. That's the brain part of the story. Then we looked at how those basic functions could be applied together to yield some kind of useful information processing. That's the mind part of the story. Now, believe me, I recognize there's a bit more to do. But the fact is that all I'm trying to see is, is to have millions of people out doing that because this is, this is the way forward. Now, practical applications will be my last topic. Another thing that I do is I work at a company called Fair Isaac Corporation. My, my friend and I were, one of the, were two of the founders of this company, which is uh, a, a pipsqueak company by IBM terms. We are on the New York Stock Exchange, but we only sell about a billion dollars a year, whereas IBM sells a hundred billion a year. So we're just n ignorable. But we have great ambitions. Let me just show you a product, a hypothetical product, that might someday exist. Listen carefully. Chancellor, it looks like we're down to the last few days of cat food. Please order some more. Shall I order two bags as usual? That would be fine, thanks. Two bags of cat food have been ordered. They will arrive on Friday. We don't want Zeus to go hungry. I'll play it once again in a while. If we're going to build this thing, we have to have a road map. We have to have a technology road map. Because, by the way, this isn't some science fiction thing. This is an actual project to build that thing you just saw. Something that can converse back and forth with you just as I can. Maybe better. And it will carry out tasks for you. So these are some of the technical requirements that we have to meet. We have to build these their various pieces. This is a block diagram of this system. Now you're saying, well, it looks like these things are just hung together. Yeah, kind of like the pieces of tissue in the cerebral cortex. They're linked together with knowledge links that occur because of the co-occurrence of different symbols in different uh, thalamocortical modules. Now you start to see the significance of this thing. 
This is a response sentence generator. Obviously, right now, all it's generating is the next story, the ne uh, a plausible next sentence of a news story. But if we send in more guidance from, say, uh, modules that describe a task or, or uh, sound uh, uh, inputs or whatever, then it's going to be able to modify its output appropriately. Now, some of you are going to say, if it were that easy, that, that's just going to change all of history. If that's really basically, of course, it's a little bit more complicated, but I mean, just like the architecture of the brain has to be genetically determined, you have to, you have to basically experiment over, over vast quantities of time to get the design right. Same thing here. But the fact is that, that the basic principles are now laid down, and we can do things like this. Just pick one of these and read it. Just one. Again, ask yourself three things. One, what must this system know about English? Now, you're probably wondering, has it ever seen these sentences? No. The material we used to, to establish the knowledge links came before these things. We, went, we actually went to the Detroit News online and got these sentences. So this is all novel. It's never seen these phrasings. It's never seen these descriptions. So think about what it needs to know about English to, to craft these sentences. Second, what, need, what does it need to know about the world? And third, what percentage of Americans could do this? Pick any one. Now, obviously, some of you are going to say, yeah, 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 it's just language. It's just a bunch of symbols anyway. It's no wonder symbols work. Symbols are all language is. Well, this is, this is not symbols. This is sound. These are the words being spoken. Market, continued, obviously this is slow motion. The word with the blue overline is the actual word being spoken in. What, what's this stuff? This is our little simplified model of the cochlea and the auditory nuclei of the brainstem. And guess what this is? This is a thalamocortical module having its symbols respond to this sound. You get somewhere between 10 and 40 symbols responding when there is sound. Now you're saying, well then, how do you link that up with everything else? It's just co-occurrence knowledge. You just literally tie them together and let the knowledge actually form as experience is gained. This, this was one of the main themes of Professor Edelman's discussion earlier is that we have to have a system that lives in an environment and then responds to that environment and continues to improve its capabilities. Now, you're probably wondering, well, you couldn't possibly recognize these words. Well, actually, our recognition is so high, we can't even measure it yet. We have to start adding noise and degrading the system soon to try to do that. Now, let me just recap this, because this is the end of the presentation. What you're going to hear is, first of all, background noise, because people are eating dinner out of the scene here. She's going to address the chancellor unit by voice, by name. That's the only time it responds. She's going to say, it looks like we're down to the last few days of cat food. It's never heard anything put that way, but it has no trouble understanding what, it, what she's wanting. It then says, shall I order two bags as usual, meaning that it's able to hark back to previous episodes of buying cat food, and it remembers that they always buy two bags. And then it goes ahead and carries out the transaction, gets a gets a uh, delivery time, tells uh, her the, the delivery time, and then it gets into a banter mode and basically says, well, it's a good thing the cat isn't going to starve. Listen to it one more time. Chancellor, it looks like we're down to the last few days of cat food. Please order some more. Shall I order two bags as usual? That would be fine, thanks. Two bags of cat food have been ordered. They will arrive on Friday. We don't want Zeus to go hungry. 
If you want to see more, just go to this website, fairisaac.com slash chancellor. Again, we have a road map. We have a system. You're probably wondering, how long is it going to take to do this? I don't even dare tell you, because you wouldn't believe it. This can be done now. I'm, I'm confident that we can actually begin building systems of this type in the very near future. I want to thank the sponsors of all this work. Fair Isaac has given me 20 uninterrupted years to concentrate on the mystery of how thinking works. And I believe that that mystery has now been solved. Of course, that's not for me to say. That's for the community to decide over long periods of time in the future. But I think there's at least some evidence to say that that may be true. And of course, the Office of Naval Research, uh, Dr. McKenna and his colleagues. And if you're interested in more details, this is my website, r.ucsd.edu. You're welcome to go there and get the, you can download all of these publications. Um, if you're interested in the details of the sentence continuation experiments, we have written them all up with all details given. We've submitted this for publication. As soon as it's published, we'll post it on the website. And finally, the cat. Without this cat, none of this would exist. It's an, un, it's an ex incredible uh, thing to, to be able to say that. I'm most delighted. That's it. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. In the acoustic processing example, what is the input representation? Is it, pix is it the waveform? Is it the spectrogram? Or do you have a front end that's, do that's recognizing the words? Very, very good question. The answer is, the, if we look at this device right here, um, it's not a spectrogram, but it it's really is meant to represent a, a, a guess as to what the brainstem auditory nuclei and the cochlea together are doing. And so this is consisting of three parts which represent the, you know, the, I mean, we do, we've done a lot of study of the neuroscience of, of, of A1 and what kinds of signals seem to be present and what functions. Um, it's just a guess. Uh, it's nothing standard. This, this is very different than wavelets or, or kepstrel coefficients or anything like that. Um, and the point is that, that it works in a way that's unbelievably robust. In fact, one of our references there that you'll find is for doing the cocktail party with a much earlier, cruder version of this. We were able to, to pay attention to one speech stream in a mixture of five with no errors. And all the same amplitude, by the way. So part of the question, so whatever the front end processor is, it's... Yeah. Uh, introducing the invariances that are needed so that a different speaker saying the same word will be recognized correctly. It, it's, it's not at all. This is just like right. you and me. It's speaker dependent. What we develop okay. is, a, is a repertoire of many, many, many different speakers. And when we meet a new person, we, we utilize all that experience to understand what they're saying. But I can introduce okay. you to people from, say, northern Scotland that you won't understand today. But three days from now you will. Um, thinking of all the points Steve Grossberg has made about the need for controlled forgetting, I'm wondering when you load this system, how far back uh, does it keep track of these linkages? Do you put w weights in according to time? Do you have a forgetting mechanism? Excellent question. The fact is that in, cogn in cognitive knowledge, there is no forgetting. That's why the process of laying down cognitive knowledge is so careful requires many, many revisitations over the day of the, of the initial linkage and the subsequent days to confirm that you want to, want, to, want to actually keep that knowledge. If you have erroneous knowledge in your head of, of a cognitive nature, it's very difficult to work around. You have to build around it. Now, now skill knowledge goes very fast, so there's a tremendous amount of forgetting in the cerebral cortex, but it doesn't have anything to do with cognitive knowledge. It's not the layer two, three neurons to the layer two, three neurons. It's, it's, it's a different set of synapses. And they're very, very short-lived. Hi, I had two questions. Um, we saw that it was very good at English grammar and syntax. I was wondering if you've started 
to do experiments with other languages and maybe if there's difficulties with non-Latin-based languages or non-Germanic. And secondly, I noticed in the Chancellor um, cat food dispenser simulation, she says thank you to the machine. Did you build in something where maybe it's nicer to you if you're polite to it? Um, <laughs> or can it even learn that? Um, to answer your second question first, uh, the, the operational concept of this machine is very, very much open to determination. And, and that's a subtlety that we've never even considered. So I, I can't answer that. With respect to different languages, we've taken a simpler version of this system and we've exposed it to Chinese, Arabic, Spanish. And in all of those cases, it ha as long as you put in enough textual material, it was able to actually absorb those languages just as well as English. And so I'm confident from those, now those were much more limited experiments, but, but it worked just as well or better. Uh, you, it's hard to know, you know. At, at this stage, but sure. it looks like that that uh, is going to be absolutely no problem to extend this immediately to any language you want. Send money. Yeah, I was wondering whether you explored the connection between your work and an end-order Markov model. What was the first one? Uh, I was wondering whether you have explored uh, the connection between uh, your work and an end-order Markov model, uh, or what Shannon did in his original uh, English prediction based on n-gram models? Yeah, it, it's, it's a, it is a special case of an n-gram model, it, okay. of course. The problem is it's, it's, it's that special case that over 50, 60, 70 years nobody's ever found. And what, what would that special case be? Like, uh, it's, it's, it's just the pairwise links being combined. In other words, in a Markov model, you typically have two things, right? You have, you have the next thing and the, and the last thing. Right. Well, you can have an nth order version. Yeah, of course you can. You can have an nth order, and that's, that's a generalization of this. So this is a special case of an nth order. It's a special case in which a special kind of knowledge is used and in which an additive knowledge combination <laughs> law is used. I mean, if, if, let, me, let, me re, let me ask if, you, if I could rephrase your question. Why wasn't this discovered 50 years ago? We can talk about that. But the answer is there's no good reason. This should have been discovered 50 years ago. But it wasn't, oh. and now it has been. Next. We have a question here. Uh, I recognize this is a quick survey of a huge amount of work. I'm Thank still you. puzzled at why this is about human cognition per se, as opposed to your having not made a discovery but invented a device that can be taught the language game called English or the language game called Arabic. Uh, I don't. I somehow missed the connection between the device and what's going on up here. Well, the connection is that if we had time to go into it, the basic components of this theory are extremely consistent with what's known in neuroscience about the function of the cerebral cortex and thalamus. So, so there's there's huge amounts of inference that hasn't been discussed here. But if we were to go do that, then I think your appreciation for this as a neuroscience theory would grow. Yeah, well, I'm a little puzzled. It's a really a follow-on to, to the previous question. Where, where are you? I'm right Sorry. here. Oh, wow. Thank uh, you. I'm a little puzzled about the psychological relevance. Uh, is it the hypothesis uh, that when humans form sentences, uh, they first look at the first three words they've uttered and then guess the fourth. That does not seem plausible. No, no, no. Uh, and, and, and then even in the other thing, is it the hypothesis that uh, when I've got uh, two sentences then and, and I'm presenting something, what I do is guess my third sentence on the basis of the first two? In other words, what's the psychological relevance of the, of the achievement? Well, let me paraphrase your question. It's, it's the same as asking the Wright brothers, well, why haven't you created an airliner that can take 500 people to Hong Kong? No, that's not the, the answer. Yeah. Is that undoubtedly those things will occur, but they haven't yet. Yeah, that, that wasn't the point of the question. The point of the question is was not we are in an early stage of research. Of course, yes. we all understand that. Uh, the question was what is the theory of of a, a sentence processing uh, that you have, oh, uh, which 
I, uh, uh, which leads you to think that this is the right direction to go in. There is, I mean, since Chomsky is a book in 1957, there's a lot of reason for supposing that sentence formation is not done uh, precisely by uh, first figuring out which words you've, or, uh, you've already uttered and then figure out what the next one should be. Right, and that's exactly, I mean, very good points. Now I understand. The bottom line is all of these words emerge simultaneously. They also, however, during their emergence, there is a comparing of notes so that you can begin to see. So the, 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 the brain component, the thalamocortical module that's, that's, that's assigned to choose that word is getting some indication of what the other word choices are, are going to be because those are being narrowed down. So there's this ongoing communication, but it happens all at once, just as in you and I. It's a wonderful question. We have a question here. Um, well, first a comment. I would just say uh, um, I'm an engineer, trained as an engineer, and I found this talk a little disconcerting because you made many claims. You talked about great things. You right. talked about your theory being falsifiable, and yet the examples that you gave and the data you provided provided me no information to be able to tell whether you actually had something great or whether you're blowing a lot of smoke. So I exactly. personally would prefer in the future if that you're going to make... So this example that you show here, it's easy to construct things that are plausible to people because people are great at interpreting things. It is much more difficult to do things that are right. So if you did data translation, which I've been a number of people on, it would be easier for me to judge the, the right. veracity of your statements. The thing about speech recognition, you say you have this great system, but you provide no data based on it. So I would just prefer... Right if you're going to make these great claims, to have some underlying things to, to underline them. Your, your description of your knowledge bases looks to me very similar to various kinds of probabilistic and layered probabilistic models that people are doing. You know, I, I, I'm trying to figure out what is fundamentally different from what has done, been done in other areas, and I'm left not being able to do any of those things. Well, that's fine. I mean, the bottom line is that this is primarily two things. One... It is, in fact, a neuroscience theory. But also, it is, in fact, a theory of how cognition works in general. It has, in fact, the characteristics that we know uh, match, at least to, in some respects, the real thing. In other words, there's a tremendous amount known about how cognitive processing works, how fast it works, the, the sorts of sequences of events. But uh, let, me, let me answer your question. Your question was quite clear. The bottom line is, that skepticism is always a good thing. But the fact is that in the world at large, the more requirements you load on, the less progress becomes possible. If you look at the world of linguistics, the world of linguistics eventually got to a point where there had to be definitive rigorous testing of, of different ideas. And so you had this huge multi-billion dollar infrastructure created of the Trek conferences and on and on and on. And then you could measure progress. The bottom line is, we need that. And we need to be able to answer your questions without any hesitation. In other words, you need to have answers that you are, are happy with. I'm, I'm in total agreement. Unfortunately, I'm not at a point where, where I can provide those answers. I'm suggesting that we need to get to that point. Well, uh, if uh, there are no further questions, we have a question here. Here, use this mic. Just a, a simple one. Uh, how does the system shut itself off? I mean, you got a nicely segmented sentence there. Why doesn't it just keep going? The you know, what is the notion of grammar here? A sentence has a, a stopping point, right? All right, very good. By the way, th th this has the hardware to go on and on and on. I mean, it's the same hardware down here where it did go on. Further, it, it, it created more words. The answer is that you have a series of processes that are all converging to an end state of one word, or no word, but, but in these cases, all one word. And the bottom line is that, that they compare notes as they converge. The convergence is just as certain as the movement of my arm into this new configuration. This is something that's externally controlled. It's exactly like thinking in, 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 your, in your own case. When you think you have a deliberate process of information processing and it ends and you either have an answer or you don't. I think that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bob.